I've had lots of people asking for more information on our fantastic new Cardiac Surgery for Nurses e-learning course. It's at csuals.org. Uh, just scroll down and click here and you can find all the courses. So we're going to share a few modules with you. Um, you can only see two minutes on Twitter, but if you go to my YouTube channel by clicking uh, Joel Dunning into the search function, you'll find some slightly longer examples. But of course, there's no better way than to actually log in and do the course or ask your hospital to provide this course for you. So I hope you enjoy this example module. Welcome to this module on the management of chest strains. Uh, my name is Joel Dunning and I'm going to take you through this module. Uh, if there are two things that really define the difference between a general ITU patient and a cardiac patient, it's the fact that you're going to have a patient that comes back with chest strains and pacing wires. They're the two things that I see a lot of nurses uh, sort of uh, their eyes light up and go, what am I going to do with them? But they're really straightforward to look after. So we're going to talk a bit about chest strains. First of all, why do we need chest strains? Uh, surely these damn good surgeons do such a good job that, uh, that they're not going to bleed. Uh, well, the reality is that, uh, that heart surgery is a complex operation. We do a huge number of cuts in the heart, but more importantly, we use heparin that really makes the blood very thin. And even though we reverse it with protamine, it doesn't really perfectly work. So there's quite a lot of oozing around the heart normally uh, after an operation. And the problem with the pericardium and the chest cavity is there is no way out. If we were not to put drains in, then there'd be a lot of oozing. It would go into the left and the right pleura, you'd get pleural effusions and you'd have a big problem. Typically we're going to expect about five or six hundred mils of blood over the next 12 hours. That is normal. So we need that blood to get out of the pericardium otherwise that blood's going to collect around the heart, squash it and cause a tamponade which is a catastrophe obviously. So that's what the drains are there for. They're to just get rid of that little tiny oozes of blood until all our stitching sort of clots up and heals up. So that's why we do uh, put chest strains in. Now there's a second reason. Remember when we open the chest, we often open the pleura. Uh, mostly it's when we do bypass grafts, so we don't always open the pleura so that we see the lungs, but maybe 80% of the time we'll see at least one pleura and quite often both. So that means the lungs are open in the same cavity as the heart. Now, Sometimes when we open the chest, we can damage the lungs and that can cause an air leak. And so equally, if there's an air leak, we've got to get that air out. Otherwise, you're going to get a big pneumothorax after the operation. It doesn't have to be damaged from the surgery. Sometimes putting in a central line at the very start, uh, if they're poking, they can sometimes cause a pneumothorax. So the drains are there for two reasons, not one. The most obvious one's to get rid of the blood, but it's also sometimes to get rid uh, of air. How many drains do we put in? Well, most usually you're going to either see two or three drains. And it's really down to the surgeon, how bleedy they are really. Um, so in reality, uh, people will sometimes do two uh, and they will vary as well. So sometimes they'll put one in front of the heart and one behind the heart and not put one in the pleura at all. Sometimes if one pleura is open, they'll put one in front of the heart, one behind the heart and a third one into a pleura. Sometimes if both pleura are open, they'll put one in the mediastinum and then they'll cross one one side, one the other. Oh, this is sounding complicated already, but actually just all you need to know is that you should ask when a patient comes back, where are the drains? Now the importance is because if you've got them in the pleura, it makes it much less likely that you're gonna get a pneumothorax. Whereas if the drains are just in the mediastinum, there is a bit more of a chance of a pneumothorax and a bit more of a chance of a hemothorax. So it's nice to just know where the drains are. Equally, if one's bubbling and one's not, uh, knowing that that's in the pleura rather than in mediastinum means that maybe you can take one out and not the other. So it is quite useful to know where your drains are. Now the drains are just going to stay in while they're draining something. Once the drainage has stopped, we want to get them out because they can be sore and we want the patient to mobilise. 
When you take a patient back from theatre and you're having your hand over, really importantly, uh, find out where these drains are going. They might not be written anywhere. Quite often, surgeons forget or don't put on their op note where the drains are going. So your one opportunity is to ask that anaesthetist and the team handing over, where are the drains uh, going? Are they in front of the heart? Are they behind the heart? Is the one in the pleura? Are the two in the pleura? Also, really importantly, sometimes surgeons cross their drains so that the drain that you see in the chest on this side is actually going to the right hand side and the right to the left, and sometimes they don't. So make sure you say which one's in which pleura, which one's in the mediastinum, because it might be important in later times if there's a lot of drainage from one side or if there's air leak just from one side. You might help the surgeons if there's excessive drainage. So your team's come, they've delivered the patient to you and they've, uh, and they've disappeared. That's what they do pretty quickly, isn't it? Um, so have a look straight away at what the drain bottles, how much they've got in them. Some, sometimes there might be nothing, but sometimes there might be two or 300 mils of blood in there uh, already. So just write that down straight away, but don't count that as your, as your starting point. So start at zero uh, uh, on your chart. Um, also, is there any bubbling? Connect it up to suction, uh, and, but then look, are there any bubbles? It shouldn't really bubble. If there is bubbling, then they've damaged a bit of lung and then there's an air leak and you won't be able to take those drain out unless there's been no air leak for six hours. Um, we put quite a lot of importance on putting the drain on suction. So that's a tube going to the wall low thoracic suction. Now really importantly, remember, you've got different types of suction and it's the adapter in the wall that's key here. Make sure it's low thoracic suction. Now the settings on low thoracic suction are either in kilopascals or centimeters of water. So kilopascals, it's minus one and a half or two. And then to convert to centimeters of water, there's a 10 times difference. Don't ask me why there's two scales. That's a big, bigger question. Um, but uh, it's really important that you don't put it in the high suction that you use for the Yanka suckers, because they are way higher, and it's really important that they're not used for the suction. You need specific low thoracic suction. Now, surgeons are very fixated on their suction, but it doesn't matter if it gets disconnected a bit, because the drain's still open, uh, and so you're not gonna cause a problem. We just quite like to suck a little bit. It puts a little bit of negative pressure uh, in the drain that just helps a tiny bit to get the blood out. It's not that important because it's that underwater seal part of the drain that stops air going back into the patient. Just a quick note on what, how does an underwater seal drain work? Well, it's very simple. You've just got a tube dipped into water. If the patient takes a big deep breath in, then all that water goes up the tube and the higher it goes up the tube, the more force downward it causes and no air is gonna go into that patient's chest. So it stops air gushing back. If you had an empty bottle with just air, if you take a deep breath in, there'll be loads of air going back into the chest and they get a double pneumothorax. That's why you've got an underwater seal drain. Uh, that's why the water's there. So you get your patient back, you put them on suction, you check the level, see if there's any air leak. Uh, and then a really good tip is to check all the connections. They'll have put some drains in and then they'll have connected some tubing to those drains the surgeons are gonna be tired. It's the end of the case. They've sometimes even left this bit to the trainee. So sometimes they don't push them in all that hard. So they give it a good hard shove. And sometimes I quite like to even put a little bit of tape around the joint, because it's a real pain if they become disconnected. So just don't let that happen. So make sure that's great. Then the second thing is make sure the drains have to be below the level of the patient. I just said about that water column going up and up in the drain. If your drain's higher than the patient, it's actually gonna gush into the patient. So that would be really silly. They fill full of water and you'd feel really dopey. So don't do that. Uh, the drain must always be below the level of their waist. If you are gonna transfer a patient and you feel you have to lift the drain up above them, just kink the tubing just for a short while. Uh, and that's, that's very safe if there's no air leak. If there is an air leak, then that's not really a safe thing to do. So just be careful with that. Uh, finally, just uh, ask the receiving team uh, if, you've, if you've been given purse strings. So surgeons are a bit variable, variable about this, how they stitch their drains in. They will have always done one stitch to hold the drain in. 
uh, but mostly they'll also give you a second stitch that's free that when you pull the drain out at the end you can tie uh, to close the hole but they don't always and they do it in about a thousand different ways so just make sure you've got a purse string and you know what stitch what suture you're gonna have to cut when those come out because when you get handover that's your only opportunity to talk to anyone that's been in theatre because they're all going to disappear aren't they hope that's useful so you've been left with this patient and now we've got to look after these drains. Uh, mostly uh, we will want you to record hourly uh, what the drainage is, starting at a zero point from when you receive the patient. If you get a patient with 300 mils in, that's, that's theatre's problem. They probably should have changed the drain for you. So start your chart at zero, even if it's 300 there. Just document that it starts from there. Um, so what's acceptable? Uh, well, if we're draining in the first two, three hours, 100 mils or less per hour, that's pretty good, really. Um, if it's one to 200 mils, that's a little bit concerning. And 400 mils or more is, is really far too much. And we need to tell somebody about this. Um, as we get further and further away from the operation, uh, we want this drainage to trickle off. So after eight eight hours after surgery, if you're still doing 100 mils and 100 and 100 uh, and then 50, then 100, then that's actually very concerning. So in our unit, we, we like to say less than 100 is great, 100 to 200 concern, 400 is an emergency and tell somebody. Uh, this will vary a little bit from unit to unit, uh, but, but that's a sort of general rule of thumb. Now, equally concerning actually is a drain that goes 400, 400, zero, because Either all the drains have clotted up, or less likely, all the bleeding stopped, because you would expect it to go 400, then 300, then 100, and trickle off slowly. So if some drains suddenly block, uh, or suddenly stop draining for an hour, then check the tubes really carefully. Now every unit has a different policy for something called stripping. That's where you get your fingers and squeeze along the tube to try and get the clot down the tube. Some people even roll it around their finger and actually there are some little devices with little rollers that you can try and squeeze the clot down. Some people believe in this, some people think it's a complete waste of time. There have even been some drains invented but they've got a little pipe cleaner in it to clean the clots out. Uh, but certainly something embarrassing like the tubing being kinked uh, would be a very good reason for, for there being zero in one hour. So just check, make sure you can see the drain tubing always uh, and put it over your, uh, over your uh, sheets or blankets if you can so it's in good vision, unkinked. And if you see clot, feel free to, to do a bit of milking if you, if you like, but I, I'm not sure I see too much of a point in it. One other thing that's talked about a lot is a swing on the drain. What's this? Well, it's not bubbling, so you won't see bubbles coming out all the time, but every time the patient breathes, or the ventilator breathes for them more accurately, the column of air just goes up and then down. As the intrathoracic pressure goes negative breathing in, it'll go up, and as they breathe out, it goes down. All a swing means is that drain is in the chest. If the drain had slipped out and was only in the subcutaneous tissue, it would be completely static. If the drain has blocked from clots, you won't see that swing. So not having a swing is very abnormal in thoracic surgery. You should always see a swing with respiration. If it's completely static, your drain has blocked, uh, and that is a cause for concern and should, you should notify somebody. So let's talk about some troubleshooting. So there are several problems you can have with a chest drain, uh, and let's talk first about disconnection. Remember I said let's really check those connections so that they don't get disconnected. But if one gets disconnected, uh, then you know that's, that's a bit urgent, that's a bit of an emergency, so you've got to address it immediately. So how are you going to find out? Well, you might just see it get disconnected, but more usually you won't notice it because maybe it was under a sheet or you weren't looking. The thing you'll suddenly notice is there's a sudden stack of bubbling in the drain where there wasn't any bubbling before. So check your tubing when you see a sudden load of bubbles. You might even hear the bubbling. Uh, which has notified you and then immediately reconnect the tubes 
Um, now that's de-sterilized them a little bit, but you just have to take that one on the chin and reconnect them. And then you should probably uh, notify your medical staff because air has now gone into the chest. Now, if they were being ventilated, then you might not have caused a pneumothorax, but if they've been extubated and the patient's breathing in, there could well now be a pneumothorax. So do an ABC assessment. Check the airway hasn't moved, check the breathing, has the respiratory rate gone up, maybe even get a stethoscope out, listen, breath sounds both sides. Have your sats gone down? Have the tidal volumes gone down on your ventilator? Are any ventilator alarms going off showing a low tidal volume uh, or high pressure alarms? Those are indicators of a pneumothorax. So reconnect the tubes, inform your medical staff, ABC assessment, and most medical staff would recommend just getting a chest x-ray to just have a look. And if if you've got the lungs re-expanded then no harm has come from that chest tube disconnection. As I said before, far better to prevent and never have a disconnection by taping the connections or pushing them in really strongly, but every now and again you will get one, so go through that protocol. Second problem you might get is blocking or kinking. We talked about that a bit. If you suddenly got a zero in one hour, check the tubes, uh, maybe try milking or stripping it, uh, make sure they're nice and straight and look for a swing. If you've got no swing whatsoever, you've got blocked tubes and you should notify the medical staff. Um, third problem you could have uh, is an air leak. Now an air leak isn't, uh, you know, it's just something that happens from time to time. Uh, and if you've checked the connections that there's no disconnection, uh, then it's an indicator that a bit of lung is torn. You cannot take those drains out. Even if you've got you no know, drainage whatsoever, do not take those drains out uh, the next morning because you'll get a pneumothorax. So never take a drain out if there's an air leak. And you need six hours with no air leak after you've seen one to really be safe. Another common emergency is that the chest drain bottle gets knocked over. Uh, you know, easy to do, so try and prevent it by hooking the chest drain up uh, on the bed or putting it somewhere safe, but, but one day, sooner or later, uh, one will get knocked over. Now, the problem is that the tube is now no longer in an underwater seal environment. It's open to the air, so that means they're likely to get a pneumothorax. More likely if they're extubated than intubated, uh, but likely. So, number one, put it back up, get it back under on an underwater seal. Uh, that's important, get the suction back on. Then ABC assessment, check the airway, uh, check the breathing, check the sats, listen to breath sides, both breaths, breath sounds both sides, uh, and say to yourself, have I given them a pneumothorax? Have the tidal volumes gone down? Are the pressure alarms going off, uh, indicating low tidal volumes from a pneumothorax? Uh, if you stand it back up, get it back on suction, that should relieve the pneumothorax, really. Uh, but then notify your medical staff and probably get a chest uh, x-ray as well. So that's it, you now know everything about chest strains. So I hope that's been helpful uh, and you can now move on to the questions. So I hope you enjoyed watching that example module. Remember you can find the full course at csu-als.org. We're just showing you where to find it on the website here. There's uh, basic, intermediate and advanced. Uh, of course it does cost if you do it directly, but uh, perhaps ask your hospital if they can get in contact with us and provide it for you for free. We're very happy to uh, work with hospitals because uh, this is such a valuable and useful resource for everybody. So uh, ask me any questions if you like. Uh, just put Joel Dunning into Google and you can find my website and I'd love and appreciate any feedback you might have for me. Thanks a lot.